it occurred to me that strong ethical standards, patriotism, nation building, all these three concepts prefigure or suppose yet another concept, that of society. Because only societies desire or can be said to lack ethical standards. On another day, I can explain to you that there is nothing like individual ethical standards. You can't set your own individual ethical standards outside of society because, you know, if you live in a world that we live in, the modern white racist world, you can set yourself ethical standards as a black person and say that I'm going to be morally upright. The world has concluded that all black people are not moral. So it doesn't matter what you do and say is your individual moral standard. But the point I'm making is that only societies have or desire or can be said to let moral or strong ethical standards. Patriotism also, the love of the country, again supposes a country or a society deserving of citizens' civic love. Again, the concept of nation building, it's an undertaking whose condition of possibility is the acceptance or the desirability of a cohesive society. So all I'm trying to do is to demonstrate that all these three concepts of nation building, patriotism, and strong ethical standards all presuppose or prefigure yet another concept which is that of society. So it is against this backdrop that I decided to take a step back from the thematic challenge that was given to me and examine anew what might first appear like an intellectually jaded question by now, which is the encounter between education, nation building, and patriotism. Now this may appear like a tired question that has been you know, threaded or threaded a path that might have been threaded several times before. That's why I say that it might by, it might by now be an intellectually jaded question. But I want to revisit the question anew and see whether we might not be able to infuse it, you know, with some new forms of intellection. And so I decided as such chair <coughs> to allow myself the liberty of reformulating the topic to guide our conversation today slightly differently. And I decided to give the following title to the thematic for the reasons that I have outlined. The, the title is Education as an Instance for the Social Reproduction of Society. The title under which we are going to guide our conversations this morning is Education as an Instance for the Social Responsibility, or rather, Education as an instance for the social reproduction of society. Chair, I have to beg for the room's indulgence. The subject we are going to deal with is going to get a little tears and a little dense at some moments, but we'll try and make it comprehensible by the time we finish. So at moments when it sounds and appears dense, please do not be deterred. We will, by the end, you know, try and make it as comprehensible as possible. <laughs> so that said, let us begin in attending to the theme that I have outlined, which is education as an instance for the social reproduction of society. Now I've used that concept instance in the way in which Marxists do, you know. Um, I hear the to here, I hope political education still happens. You know, um, <laughs> the notion of the instance. So, Chair, <clears throat> I'm going to begin by drawing a heuristic device. And this heuristic device is going to allow me to plot at two extremes two dominant ideas of what education is. And I call it a heuristic device because I know that education can be viewed in different ways. So as I said, as a heuristic device, permit me to situate the prevailing wisdom 
on the role of education in society today at two polar opposites of a thought spectrum. So I want to suggest that there are two dominant views of what education is and what is the purpose of education in society. And these two dominant views in South Africa today sit at the extreme ends of this, of this thought spectrum. On the one hand of the spectrum, the somewhat dominant view presents education as the site where skilled manpower is produced. So the dominant view on this one extreme presents education as the site where skilled manpower is produced. For those who subscribe to this viewpoint, the primary function of education is to prepare the mind for the market. For those who subscribe to this view, education has one primary responsibility, which is to prepare the mind for the market. At other times, of course, they do not say it is to prepare the mind for the market, but they would say it is to prepare the mind for the world of work. So this viewpoint on one extreme of the thought spectrum is a very powerful viewpoint because it is aided and abetted by what I want to call bourgeois objective rational scientific thought. It has behind it a body of thought we simply would call bourgeois rational scientific thought. In short, this is liberal rationalism. All that high-sounding bourgeois objective rational scientific thought is basically to emphasize that this is how liberal rationalists want to view education. As I said, it reduces educa education to educating the mind so that it is prepared for the market or imbuing it with the necessary skills. And so, to reiterate the point, at one extreme end of this thought spectrum, you have this dominant viewpoint that considers education as nothing but a place where you prepare the mind for the market. Aided and abetted by bourgeois objective rational scientific thought, this viewpoint not only reduces educating the mind to preparing it for the market or imbuing it with the necessary skills, but it also presents education as value free. It wants to suggest to us that education is ideologically neutral. It wants to suggest to us that education is an objective site where technical knowledge is acquired. Ultimately, this viewpoint succeeds in creating a gulf between ideology or more appropriately, it succeeds in creating a gulf between science on the one side or education and ideology on the other. It says that these two things are separate. One indeed must habit the school, which is science. Ideology, we leave it for political parties or some other organizations. Now this is the success of the liberal rationalist idea of education that wants to present to us education as nothing but an objective technical or acquisition of the technical know-how. Now, I do not have the time to dispute this idea that science and ideology do not cohabit, or that they are not one. But I could use just two illustrations to show you, but on another day we can you know, go over the subject at length. You see, the fallacy of the distinction between science and ideology is fairly easy to prove. That this is a fallacious idea is fairly easy to prove. Some of you may have been mathematics teachers in your lives before. And you go around telling students that mathematics is a universal or it contains universal truths. Such that you say one plus one equals two everywhere in the world. But we know it's not true. Add one drop of water and another drop of water in your glass and see whether you get two drops of water. <laughs> you don't. The only reason why one plus one is true 
It's because there are certain pre-scientific suppositions that we must accept. Axioms. So those who teach mathematics will tell us that there are certain axiomatic assumptions that you must accept. You can't debate with the axioms. You have to accept them as they are. Those axioms is precisely what we call pre-scientific assumptions. They are ideological. It's ideology that makes science possible. Or, if you were an economist, you go around telling us that, you know, economic laws are universal, such that, you know, if you do one, two, three, the economy will grow at a certain rate. And then you give us the law, such as parables, all things being equal. But we all know that things are never equal. But we have to accept that principle. People basically plan whole economies on the basis of something that is not true, which is that all things are equal. But as I said, we do not have the time to you know, prove the fallacy of education or science being outside of education. I was just giving you the two illustrations because my object is elsewhere today. So you have this viewpoint, the liberal rationalist viewpoint on the one end. On the other end, you have yet another viewpoint which foregrounds the liberatory potential of education. So according to this school of thought, education ought to lead to self-actualization or to self-realization. So when properly designed, Education is supposed to transform the self and endow it with an empowered ethic. Now again, in the midst of educators, I do not have to say that this viewpoint, its theoretical anchor is Paulo Ferreira. It is the education theorist Paulo Ferreira who has elaborated this alternative viewpoint of education. Again, I do not have to restate the fact that this viewpoint styles itself as a critique to the first viewpoint I elaborated, which is the liberal rationalist viewpoint. So this one, which emphasizes the liberatory potential of education, styles itself, as I've said, as a critique to the liberal rationalist. So, In a word, the second viewpoint considers education or considers the function of education to be nothing but conscientization. Now, my object today, Chair, is to suggest to you that there is perhaps outside of these two viewpoints yet another way of thinking about education that is a critique of both these viewpoints that might land us somewhere else. And for this conceptualization, for this alternative conceptualization of education, I lean heavily on the work of a French structuralist Marxist called Louis Althusser, particularly his work titled Ideology and Ideological State Apparatus. So I am going to try and outline this alternative view of education, and as I've said, for it I'm going to lean heavily on Louis Althusser. And I'm going to begin by making an observation that Althusser himself makes in a slightly different way, which is that any social formation, any social formation which does not reproduce at the same time as it produces, the conditions of its reproduction will not survive long. Let, let's, let's restate that any social formation or any society, let's be more simpler, any society which does not reproduce the conditions of production at the same time as it produces will not last. Which is to say, basically, any society that does not guarantee its continued existence must acknowledge that it will not last. It's, as a society, you do not guarantee the conditions of your reproduction, you are not going to last. 
So all that sophisticated you know, language was meant simply to say that any society which does not reproduce the conditions of production at the same time as it produces will not last. Which again, as I've said, is to say that to guarantee its continued existence, society must acknowledge that the most fundamental or ultimate condition of production is the reproduction of the conditions of production. Again, as I said, you know, we'll get out of this at the end, you know, a, a little clearer about what it means. So do not be deterred by the complex vocabulary here. It will all become clearer in a moment. What for now I want to implore you to do is to try and hold on to just this simple line, which is that any social formation or any society to last must reproduce the conditions of production at the same time as it produces. Now, perhaps a logical question to ask at this point, what is meant by this reproduction of the conditions of production at the same time as it produces? Before I answer at a theoretical level or at the level of thought, let me give you a practical example to illustrate what we mean. Take, my notes are now betraying me because see, my notes here are saying that formulate an example. <laughs> um, so I have to formulate an example now. So take, for instance, an entity called Toyota as a representative, a microcosm of society. Toyota produces car, at least when it assembles and doesn't produce that means so. You know, Toyota produces cars. As it produces cars, it has, in the moment of production of the assembling of cars, it also has to guarantee the conditions of its own reproduction. And how does it do that? It has to make sure that it is constantly supplied with electricity, with steel, with machinery, with all other things that it needs in order to be able to produce. What do those things constitute? They constitute the conditions of reproduction for Toyota. On the other hand, Toyota also has to make sure that it has labor power that is going to present itself every day at work, ready to work. And how does it guarantee that? Through what Marx is called the wage capital. But all that Toyota does is to pay a wage to the workers so that they can feed, so that they can buy soap, wash their you know, overalls like mine, present themselves the following day at work, ready to work. That, that is meant by the reproduction of the conditions of production as you produce. Now here is the important thing. Here is the important thing. Let us move back then to the level of, of, of thought. If that practical example does it, from what we have said, we can then see that every social formation, as we've said, must reproduce the conditions of, of its production at the same time as it produces. In order to be able to produce, it must guarantee the material conditions of production. So all these things we've mentioned, the steel, the capital, the labor, these are what we call the material conditions of production. However, this reproduction of the material conditions of production cannot be fully undertaken within the confines of the individual establishment. Toyota can provide itself with all these material conditions of reproduction. It has to depend on other agencies to do it for it, isn't it? <clears throat> and so, within the confines of an individual establishment, the individual factory floor or shop floor, the material conditions of reproduction cannot be undertaken. So what it means is that establishment A, which is Toyota in this instance, has to depend on establishment B and C and D to produce those products, the machinery, the electricity, the steel, which are the conditions of reproduction of its conditions of production. So it means that Toyota has to depend on establishment A, B, and C 
in order to get those material conditions of production. Now, enough, I think, about you know, the reproduction of the material conditions of production. That's not our main concern in this talk. But I couldn't get to the point where I want to, without having to go through this somewhat test, you know, explication. Because education is not concerned with the material conditions of reproduction of society. It's concerned with something else. But in order to fully appreciate that something else, we needed to be able to dispense with the material conditions of reproduction. Now, I suppose you can already see where we are driving at, which is that just like establishment B and C supply to Toyota material conditions of production, in a moment it will become clear that you supply to society other non-material conditions of reproduction as education. But we'll explain. So, to expand our horizon beyond the material conditions of production, I suggest that then that we return to our example, again, you know, of Toyota that we spoke about earlier. So we spoke about labor, which Toyota is able to procure using wage capital, which is basically the salary it pays to its workers so that they are able to feed clothes themselves and come back to work the following day. Now that is material labor. That is labor as biology. You provide it with sustenance, you provide it with food, you provide it with soap so that it washes its clothes and then it comes back. But you are thinking about labor in a very limited sense as biology basically, as people who have to present themselves to work. However, to reproduce labor as labor power, it is not enough to ensure just its material conditions, or rather to ensure the material conditions of its reproduction. So it's not enough to provide workers with just food, with clothing, so that they are able to come back to work the following day. The material conditions are enough to reproduce labor only in its flesh and blood, only as biology. And by the way, again, it's a subject some other day we may have time to talk about. It is that we talk about the minimum wage as if the minimum wage is something that you can scientifically determine simply on the basis of the material needs of the worker. The minimum wage is not dependent on the material needs of the worker so that the worker is able biologically to reproduce itself and in other words. The minimum wage is a historically determined figure. You see, if you go to France, the French working class requires in addition money for wine. <laughs> if you go to Britain, the working class in Britain requires in addition money for beer. Because the minimum wage, I'm trying to dissuade you from the notion that the minimum wage is something that you can scientifically determine on the basis of people's needs. You know, economists fool us and say, let's look at the basket, you know, at the food basket at the end of the month. A family of four, what does it need? In that food basket, it doesn't include alcohol. But nonetheless, that's, that's a, a subject for another day. <laughs> so, the point is that to be competent, labor must be reproduced not as biology. It must also possess the necessary technical know-how. So labor must not reproduce, it's not enough to reproduce labor as concrete biology by providing for its material needs. It must also possess the necessary technical know-how. Now since the modern age, since the era of modern industrial capitalism, the factory floor long ceased to be the site where labor acquires the requisite skills. It long ceased the factory floor long ceased to be the site where labor acquires the requisite skills in order to function in a complex system of production. So the system of apprenticeship since the industrial age was found to be inadequate. In place of the factory floor as the place where skill is acquired or the technical know-how is acquired, 
modern education system epitomized by the school has since become that instance charged with the responsibility of transforming labor as concrete biology into labor as skilled labor force. So, the school since the modern industrial age has, or the education system, let's not just say the school, the education system as a whole, since the mod era of modern industrial capitalism, has a major, as one of its major functions, transforming labor as concrete biology into labor as skilled labor force. You only have to think about, you know, the transformations a child in the education system goes through. When they come to you at grade R, you know, at the early stages of learning, they are nothing more than biology. And then you transform them through the system until the end, you know, they have other capabilities, but mainly intellectual capabilities. So, at this point, you may detect a similarity between this viewpoint I'm trying to elaborate and the liberal rationalist viewpoint that suggests that education is nothing but a site where skill is acquired. If you think that there are similarities between this liberal rationalist position we elaborated earlier, which considered teaching to children of technical know-how as the primary function of the education system, the, in, rather the similarities are incidental, they end here. Similarities between the viewpoint I'm trying to elaborate to you and the liberal rationalist is just incidental, and it ends here. So, while all of you here and the teachers set to work every day, what you do every day when you wake up, all of you here and the teachers, what you basically do is to set to work every day is a machinery or a system whose real essence is the transformation of labor as concrete biology into labor as skilled manpower. Now let us discipline this understanding so that it doesn't sound quite like the liberal rationalist idea of education. What we have established here is that you have labor that has to be transformed from you know, being concrete biology into labor that has skilled manpower. But to transform that labor from concrete biology to skilled manpower, you need more than just the material conditions of its production, which is food and everything else. So you need something more than that. And we've said that that role is the role of the modern education system. And we've said that that task of transforming labor into skilled manpower is no longer undertaken from the factory floor. The factory floor is no longer adequate. That responsibility has since shifted, you know, um, or since the modern industrial period, that responsibility has been assigned to the education system. Now, it is precisely this process of transforming labor that I want to examine very closely. That process of transforming labor from concrete biology into successful labor power or into skilled labor power. I think we can examine this process of transforming labor as concrete biology into labor as skilled manpower by asking what do children learn at school? What, do, what does the education system do? Now, the answer at face value seems very obvious. It is that they learn the technical know-how or the technical subject matter or content of their different subjects. So you may say that when children at school learn the technical subject matter of mathematics or you know, all the other different subjects they do. Now, I want to suggest to you today that much more or that there is something much more fundamental than the technical know-how or the technical subject matter of the different subjects that the children learn at school. 
Let me be more clear. I want to suggest to you that something much more fundamental is taught to children at school rather than just the technical know-how or the technical subject matter. And what is this other thing that children learn at school that I consider much more fundamental than just the subjects that we teach them? It is that the children at school learn a whole regime of rules and expectations coterminous with their location in the socio-technical division of labor. Children learn a whole series or regime of rules and expectations coterminous with their location in the socio-technical division of labor. Again, don't be deterred by the high-sounding language. What we mean here simply is that children at school learn or that children, what children learn at school are basically rules of good behavior. The attitude that should be observed by every agent in the division of labor according to the job he or she is destined for. Children learn the rules of morality, civic and professional conscience, and actually, which actually means rules of respect for the socio-technical division of labor and ultimately the rules of order established by the dominant strata in society. Now, that sounds a bit muddy. Let's simplify. More than the technical subjects, children learn at school the rules of behavior. And these rules of behavior are in accordance with their location in the division of labor in society. You see, there is a reason you wear suits. <laughs> It is because you've learned that for the station you occupy in the division of labor, this is the most appropriate behavior. <laughs> no one compares you, but it is what you have learned. So the education system, what we mean is that the education system teaches etiquette that is in line with one's location in the socio-technical division of labor. So there is a certain kind of behavior that you think is expected of you as a DG or as a medical doctor or as anyone who occupies a certain position in the social technical division of labor and you act accordingly. That's what children learn at school beyond just the technical subjects. And this division of etiquette in accordance with one station in the division of labor, in the socio-technical division of labor, is not determined by you. It's determined by the dominant strata in society. And I've said dominant strata deliberately, not dominant class. It's determined by the dominant strata. So I often hear, you know, um, people who say, no, this is my style. Um, you know, I prefer to dress this way because it's my style. I mean, absolute nonsense. The market has decided that for people who earn this much, who make these kinds of products that, you know, cost this much. So your style is determined for you. There's someone who already said and decided that for those who earn this much, we will design clothes of this nature because they can afford it. <laughs> So, what people learn at school is not just the technical subject matter. I'm trying to demonstrate to you that there is something much more fundamental that children learn at school, which is the etiquette, it is the regime of rules, formal and informal, many of them informal, that actually governs one's behavior in accordance with your location in the social technical division of labor. There is not one universal etiquette. No. There is etiquette in accordance with your location in the social technical division of labor. When you go to see a doctor, all of a sudden your behavior changes, isn't it? Because you think there is a way in which to relate with the doctor. That's precise. Who taught you those things? No one. It is things that you learn at school in accordance with, you, you've learned that for the doctor this is you know, the behavior that is most appropriate for me when I go to see a doctor. 
When I go to see a white person, I must think about my story first. It must be proper. <laughs> you know, you probably will also rehearse it. <laughs> you know, um, but if you go to see a black person, you can kick the door and walk in. <laughs> no one teaches you those things. It is what you learn at school. It is that other thing that is much more fundamental that children learn at school. I hope I've already demonstrated enough that there is nothing called an education system that is value free. There is nothing like an education system that is outside of ideology. Because all of these things that I've just said are an ideology that keeps a certain kind of society functioning. Because if you rebel against wearing suits in accordance with your station in the social technical division of labor, the textile industry is going to suffer. So there are capitalists who you keep making, or rather who you keep visiting the bank simply because you have abided by you know, these rules that you learn that are in accordance with your you know, location in the socio-technical division of labor. So all that I'm trying to say is that children at school also learn rules of good behavior. But these rules of good behavior are not the things you hear people want to emphasize today, you know, rules of good behavior, you must be obedient. No, there are more fundamental rules of good behavior, which is that you must wear and you must make sure that you abide by your credit, you know, obligations. But these rules of behavior are not universal. They are in accordance with your location, you know, in the division of labor. So when an employee gets to Toyota and he or she is told that this is your level and so and so is in a level above you, they don't have to explain to that person how he or she has to behave to the person above him or her, is it? Those things are accepted. Where did you learn them? At school. So what I'm trying to say is that children at school learn good behavior. They learn the attitude that should be observed by every agent in the division of labor. They also learn the rules of morality, the rules of civic and professional conscience, which as I've said is nothing but the respect for the socio-technical division of labor and ultimately the rules of order established by the dominant structure. Now, again to exemplify this, because there's a more fundamental point that is going to follow from this that I want to make, is that if you look at children who go to Model C schools and compare them to children who go to black schools, look at their comportment and their outlook towards life. It's different from the outlook of children who go to black schools. But then you are going to tell us they learn the same mathematics. They learn the same, you know, English, the same subject. So why is it then that they come out with a different comportment, with a different expectation in life? So I teach them at the University of Cape Town, children who go to, you know, modern C schools. Even when they are the most dumbest, they suppose that because they have gone to these white schools, the world should treat them in a certain way with a certain level of deference, which is founded on nothing. But it is simply because at school, children learn other things. And so when you privatize education, when you, learn, when you allow private education to prosper, what we are giving over to someone else is the determination of societal values. We are not just privatizing. We are giving over to someone else as the government the responsibility to set societal values. And so when these children, as I say, dumb as they are because they speak English with a certain accent, they then come with the supposition that they are clients that, you know, we as lecturers have to, you know, cow, you know, to every time they have demands that must be met because I have rights. Mm. Now, you know as well as I do, or at least you know that for instance, at the University of Cape Town, school fees when paid account for only 25% of the running cost of the university. When every student has paid fees, 
it accounts for only 25%. Education is a social good. The rest of the 75% we get from the government. Now, it means that then education can't be a commodity, a right that these kids come and demand from us. It's a social good. There has to be reciprocity in the way in which they relate with us and we relate to them because literally I fund their education with my text. <laughs> what do children learn at school? It is more than just the technical subject matter, what I'm trying to demonstrate. And so, you cannot give up the responsibility of teaching to the children those other things by accepting the liberal rationalist idea that the school is an ideologically free or an objective site where people acquire skills. It is not just the school. It is the entire education system. I do not know how you hope to run an education system with the people who claim to be ideologically neutral. <laughs> You cannot, because the school, as I've just demonstrated to you, is a site of ideological inculcation or acculturation. And so, it means that the bureaucrats that you are and the teachers also have to have an ideology. I don't know an education system that doesn't have an ideology. But let us not get sidetracked. So without belaboring the point, it is, to, it is necessary to state that the reproduction of labor power, which is a primary function of the education system, requires not only a reproduction of its skills, but also an inculcation of a willing submission to and internalization as legitimate of the prevailing system of ideas and representations which order society. What I mean is simply that the education system is responsible for the inculcation of a willing submission of the populace and internalization as legitimate of the prevailing system of ideas and representations which order every individual's relations to the self individuals' relations to the other, and individuals' relations to the world. So, the education system has a responsibility of making us submissive citizens. Not submissive in the negative sense, but, you know, as citizens who internalize and accept as legitimate a certain system of ideas and representation. We accept these ideas and representations as legitimate. And this system of ideas and representations are what is necessary to order society and to order individuals' relations to the self, individuals' relations to others, and individuals' relations to the world. Now, to simplify, when you have come out of the education system, you have learned to relate to yourself as an individual in a certain way. When you have gone to school and you haven't gone to school, you can see those two people relate to their bodies in different ways. So when you go to school, you learn several other things, how to even relate to your own body. So people who've gone through the modern education system think that the body is there, it's available for fashioning and refashioning. It's like a car, you can pimp it, you know, uh, ram it up today and do whatever it is. This is the conception of the body that you end up with when you have gone to a modern education system. It's different from how people relate to their bodies when they haven't gone to school. The point I'm making is that in the school, we learn and accept a certain system of ideas and representations. These ideas govern our relations with ourselves. They govern our relations with others. They govern our relations with the world. Now, we can't then complain when society has gone astray. When we must be asking, how did the education system that has a child for 19 years to, if you include the universities, you have the mind of a child close to 24 years of life. You have a chance to fashion that mind. But all of a sudden, you complain about how this mind has gone astray. You've done something wrong. Because the education system teaches 
not just the technical subject matter. It teaches other things, the rules of good behavior, how to relate to the self, how to relate to others, and how to relate to the world. So for the avoidance of doubt, a system of ideas and representations to which we turn all the time in order to validate our relations with the self, our relations with others, and our relations with the world, that system of ideas is called ideology. We can now update our knowledge and what we have said by saying that the education system or the school teaches the technical know-how, but also teaches the ideology that is necessary for the continued reproduction of society. If society collapses, education has failed. If society is unable to reproduce itself, education has failed. Because, as we say, education teaches not just the technical subject matter, it also teaches the ideology that is necessary for the continued reproduction of society. It is precisely this ideology that ensures that citizens willingly submit to the prevailing order. It is this ideology that we teach at school that ensures that citizens willingly submit to the prevailing order. Willingly submit to the authority or power that is subsisting. It is this education system that makes it a point that citizens accept their station in life as if that station in life were God given. Now, people, I always make the example. So, if you're familiar with the part of the world I live in, we're called Cape Town, it's a very racist place. And you have Black people, large numbers in the locations, you know, Wala and Ekaeli uh, and whatnot. And then you have the leafy suburbs which are up there in the mountain. You have this mass of people who watch people live in the, mis in the leafy suburbs of Cape Town. You know, the streets in the leafy suburbs of Cape Town are actually the size of the highway. They are so clean, they are so well kept, you are better off sleeping there than sleeping in a shed. Now, but you have this mass of black people. Why don't they one day wake up and say, it's fine, we'll sleep in these streets? <laughs> Why do they accept the position they are in? It is because there is a prevailing ideology they have learned at school that your station in life, your allocation in the social technical division of labor, it's as though it's God given. It's not God given. But because you have an ideology embedded in an education system that makes it so natural that, well, maybe Utiko or Ekalil, but this is where I will be. God did not create people, you know, to be poor and other people to be rich at the expense of others. But the point I'm making is simply that ideology, it means that even when you have accepted the liberal rationalist fallacy that an education system is an objective site where people learn technical know-how. They know that there is an underlying ideology that is in their favor. So when, as you pretend that you know you are constitutionalist, you don't bring ideology to the system. You know they have already infused it already. Remember that big concept, you know, of bourgeois, objective, rational, scientific thought. Yeah. That's there. So, they are disingenuous when they say to you, don't bring ideology to the education system because they already did. <laughs> so, <clears throat> it is precisely this ideology, remember I said, this system of ideas and representations that we willingly accept because they've been given, us, given to us by the education system it is precisely this ideology, as I've said, that ensures that citizens willingly submit to the prevailing order. That's why people in Kailicha are sitting in Kailicha watching white people in Constantia, you know, in all those suburbs, live in that comfort. You accept your station in life as if it were God-given. 
So, Jesus, from what we have said, or Jesus, from what we have said, are these two indisputable truths. One is that the education system is indeed an instance for the social reproduction of society. We've just demonstrated that the education system is indeed an instance for the reproduction of society. Now, when we say that the education system is an instance for the reproduction of society, we must emphasize the fact that everyone who leaves the education system, it doesn't matter at what level you leave the education system. I had, um, you know, um, uh, uh, the chair here outlined that we are now going to allow kids to leave school at grade eight, nine. You know, when those kids leave school at grade nine, they will leave knowing what is a proper comportment that is appropriate to their station in life in relation to those who go all over the way to the university. Who will tell them that? It is the ideology of the education system. They will live, they will relate, therefore, to those who go all the way to the university and get degrees in a certain way. Now, are you able to vouch for the way they are going to relate to those other ones as something that you determine? Being people who run the education system. Certainly you can't. You don't know. You probably think, okay, well, we'll see what will happen. So, the point I'm making is that everyone who leaves the education system must leave with the kind of etiquette and good behavior and rules of, you know, responsibility that are appropriate for their station in life. <coughs> So I said there are two indisputable truths, which is that the education system is indeed an instance for the social reproduction of society. Two, an education system, in order to properly perform its function in society, cannot be but ideological. An education system, in order to perform its function appropriately in society, cannot be but ideological. Ideology is unavoidable or is an inevitable part of the education system. In some schools, they still have morning prayer assembly. It was part of the Christian national education, isn't it? It was the ideology. Why then are you shy of saying we want to reproduce society? This the problem is that we think about ideology as this monster. It's Marxism. It's no, ideology is nothing but a system of ideas and representations that we willingly accept and internalize. That's all. So to have a system of ideas and representations which are a mirror image of the society you want to create, that explicitly adopted as the ideology of the education system, there's nothing wrong with it. Let us proceed. We've noted the two indisputable truths. I know that I have been long, and I am going to try to bring my talk to a close with just two, three more comments, and then I'll shut up. <laughs> so we began this conversation by noting that any society, any social formation, which does not reproduce the conditions of its production at the same time as it produces, we said that society will not last long. Now I do want to be a little more categorical and say to you here, um, and there's nothing wrong in saying it uh, here, is that the problem with the ANC government is that it laments, you know, its loss of legitimacy or hold over the citizenry. How were you hoping to maintain that hold when you gave up the education system? When your education system does not have an ideology, because, let me be more explicit, any society, any social formation which does not reproduce the conditions of its, production, of its reproduction as it produces will not last long. If you want to be a more closer home, any regime or any state power 
which does not reproduce the conditions of its production as it produces cannot guarantee its continued existence. That's why the ANC is threatened just barely a few years after taking over power. Because it did not guarantee the conditions of its reproduction by making education an instance for the social reproduction of society. So, to reiterate, any regime or state power which does not reproduce the conditions of its production as it produces cannot guarantee its continued existence. For its social reproduction, state power, we have amply demonstrated, will have to rely on the education system, but not just on the education system, on the education system alongside other things we call the ideological state apparatus. <clears throat> so, in order to reproduce itself, state power has to depend on the educational system, but not only just on the educational system, on the other things that together with the educational system belong to what we call the ideological state apparatus. Now, what are these other ideological state apparatus? It is the institution of mass culture. It is radio and television. It is literature. It is the arts. It is sports. Sports is not a physical exercise, it's an ideological exercise. If you want an example, if you are in doubt, you know, go look at any coach of football, for instance. You know, when he decides or he has to decide, do I sign this player or not, he would have a conversation with the player. You know what he looks for, amongst other several things, other than just the skill. A good player talks to a coach with the hands at the back like this. Yeah. <laughs> then the coach knows this is a player that I can work with. This is ideology. Sports is not, sports is not a physical exercise. <laughs> <laughs> so, for social reproduction, state power, as we have amply demonstrated, We'll have to rely on the education system, but alongside other ideological state apparatuses like the institutions of mass culture, like radio, like television, like literature, arts, and sports. MEC, I'm quite acutely aware that I have not attended to the intellectual challenge that was set for me, which was talking about strong ethical standards as the foundation for nation building. But let me see, it seemed to me more prudent to first attempt an exposition of what an education system is, what its primary function is in modern society. Because if you have teachers, if you have functionaries who do not have a proper appreciation or comprehension of the very education system they run, an exhortation that they exhibit high ethical standards for whatever purpose, be it nation building, be it patriotism, would be a self-negating exercise. They will not understand why they have to exhibit high ethical standards and values because they don't understand the very system they run, what is its primary function and purpose. I suspect that after now, let me see, we are perhaps better placed and better equipped then for that conversation about the ethical standards that has to be the basis for patriotism and nation building. When that conversation finally or eventually holds, please do invite me. I thank you very much.